Um, first of all, thanks to the source team for giving me the opportunity to showcase my software demo. I want to show a few slides to at least set the stage. What is the problem and how did we try to solve it? Yeah, so um, oscillation and rhythms in nature. So here I just put a few, um, a few examples from various scientific fields. So I work in oscillations for a long time, so probably 10 years already. And if you do that, suddenly you see oscillations everywhere. But so here's just an example. For example, in astrophysics, you have this rotating neutron stars. In meteorology, maybe you heard of this El Nino phenomenon, this kind of periodic weather phenomena in South America. In chemistry, the very famous uh, Virusov-Sabotinsky reaction. Um, in economics, you have the so-called business cycles. And from biology, so which is basically my, my domain, and then you have also various systems which oscillate, so for example, circadian rhythms in all sorts of tissues and, and contexts, and then genetic oscillators. And as this tool, so PyBot was developed at the EMBL, which is an institute for molecular biology. So um, the setting it was developed for is this genetic oscillator setting. And I just want to give you an example. Um, Gregor, you can switch so your slides to full screen, to data, so. if you like. Okay. Like that. So, um, so here you see one example how that actually can work in um, in molecular biology. So it, these these boxes here, they describe a um, construct which was transfected into into mouse embryos in the end. And uh, what you have is like there's a gene which is called lunatic fringe, which is important during mouse embryonic development. And um, so this construct has the promoter of this gene, and then a fluorescent protein, which is uh, Venus, then some pest domain and uh, the three prime VTR. And um, so if you have mutant mice, which express this construct during uh, embryogenesis, then you can um, extract the cells. So for example, here you see like a, a drawing of a mouse embryo. And this oscillatory pathway we are looking at, it, it's somatogenesis, so basically how your, your body axis segments, so like the, the vertebras. And uh, so what the experimentalist at Ember here did, Christine, um, she basically extracts these cells from the mouse tails, spins them down, and then plates them out in a dish. And if she then takes um, like, uh, like an image analysis that's called Roy, so a region of interest, and records the signals of the cells over time, then you see here these traces, two examples that you get. So like oscillatory um, traces. Yeah. Um, so the problem setting in general is that we have some sort of signal or a time series, so some, some quantity which changes over time and has an, has an oscillatory component. And every oscillation can be uniquely described by an amplitude, a period or a frequency and the phase. And I think everyone knows more or less what an amplitude or what a period is. Phase is maybe a bit special. So if you imagine that over time, this, this point here would, would travel along this, uh, this sinusoidal oscillation here. And I map this movement onto the, onto the circle where you have the phase values between zero and two pi. So you see here two examples. So the orange dot would be at a bit more than zero and the uh, pink dot would be almost at pi. This is basically the, where you are in your oscillation. So for example, in a clock which runs at 24 hours has a 24 hour period, but the time is basically the phase. You know, so that's like where you are on the oscillation. And a bit theory-like, if you, if you want, um, you can characterize such a thing as a so-called analytic signal, where you see you have a time-dependent amplitude and then also a time-dependent phase inside a cosine, for example. And then one can ask like, why does it matter actually? And so many reasons. So I just really um, pulled out three here. So for example, phase encoding is, we, we usually have lunch at, so like let's say people in Singapore or people in LA or people in Berlin, um, they have all the same period, of course. So it's the 24 hour rhythm, but the phases are different, right? So like if when I have lunch, the other one sleeps and, and so on and so on. So where you are in your oscillations can be very important for, for many things, especially in biology, actually, circadian rhythms. Then frequency encoding could be equally important. So for example, for the heart rate, it maybe is not that important where you are in a specific um, heart cycle, but how fast your heart beats is probably very important. Um, and then lastly, for amplitude encoding, yeah, NF kappa B signaling, that's very uh, special. That's, that's like an inflammatory responsive pathway with also shows oscillations. 
but also a strong um, amplitude radiance, I think, yeah. Um, and of course, you can mix all three of those. So that you can basically, if you want to encode something with oscillations, then you have these three possibilities and you can, of course, mix them, like almost like an alphabet or something. So back to the, so now we have a signal uh, nicely flat here with a little um, amplitude uh, gradient. But in the real world, we often, of course, have noise uh, that we encounter. So either intrinsic noise, the system itself is noisy, or at least, especially in biology, the, the measurements are noisy. Um, and then you often also have a trend. So that means like some underlying slow dynamic, which could be, again, either intrinsic or extrinsic. But that can also, as you can see, you hardly can actually see the oscillation anymore, right? So basically from, from blue to the, to the third row, so really quite some way. And then one point which was specifically important for me, and sometimes I think that maybe especially in biology, people don't take as much care about it, is that if you really only have noise, you don't want your, your analyzer to suddenly spit you out some spurious result. Um, and I think now is the time where I would do a little, uh, I would like a little feedback of you. So I could show like seven, eight slides about a bit like wavelet theory, how does it actually work? But I could also skip that. So either you can um, give me uh, auditory feedback or you just go to this participant window, which for me is actually gone. And there you can click on um, either you like it or you don't. But I really don't see the window. Is that because I'm sharing my screen? I, I, somehow I can't go to the participants. Yes, if you um, Maybe don't see the window, so you can make it visible it. on the top. If you go to this, um, the, if you hover over the top, you can make it visible. But there ah. are about um, three okay. yeses so I see... that I can see, four yeses that I can see so far. All right. Um, okay. So, I mean, um, let's say the oldest way of, of analyzing periodic signals is, of course, the Fourier transform. And the Fourier transform um, works by decomposing your signal in, in cosines and sines, right? And if you think about it, so a cosine function basically comes from minus infinity and goes to plus infinity. So the, the, the frequency or the period of the cosine will be, has no time localization. And the idea from Gabo already in 1947 was, well, then I, I give these Fourier modes a time localization. And he really uh, did it by simply um, multiplying a Gaussian onto a Fourier mode. Yeah, so what you see in the dashed line would be the, the cosine, the Fourier mode, then you see the Gaussian. And if you, the resulting function is nowadays called the Morlet wavelet. This is the blue thing. And if we take this formula, so the formula looks, if you, if you really look closely, you just see there's some prefactor and then there's a, complex exponential and, and, uh, and the Gaussian function. And if we take the, Gauss, uh, the, the, the complex exponential apart, then we just see our Fourier modes, the cosine and the sine. So in that sense, um, if you are somewhat okay with Fourier, the step to wavelet is, is, is actually quite easy. So now that we have that, um, of course, uh, wavelets are complex. I mean, they're actually also real wavelets, but they are not really used for time frequency analysis. They're used for peak detection, for example. Um, yeah, so the wavelet is complex, so that means all the results we get are complex and so on, but I think I will come to that later. Um, so now that we have our wavelet, we can do two operations. So one is translation. So I said like we have a localization in time, so basically I can shift the thing on my time axis left and right. And we have a change of wavelength, which is called dilation. So I can either uh, basically make a very high frequency wavelet or what you see here on the right, a wavelet with a very long period, a very low frequency. Um, and now we have this real this, this family of wavelets. And what you do is like you um, you basically decide what is the, the, the lowest period and what is the highest period you want to to, uh, to, to scan for or like to, to check your signal for. And then for every of those periods you slide one the wavelet of the of the um, respective period you slide it along your signal. So it's a convolution after all. And here in uh, C, I try to show that a bit. So it's the same wavelet, which at this time point, uh, which is here denoted by tau two, really perfectly overlaps with the signal. So this gives a very good um, cross-correlation score if you want. I can slide it along. 
but then suddenly our rate is actually too, uh, too slow. And then the cross correlation also goes down. And this now you do for all the wavelets, and then therefore you can stack that together. And you see here this, this red dashed line. This is exactly what is shown here in C. So this you see that roughly in the middle you have the you have the highest um, power. And um, for example, here when the signal is slower, of course the slower wavelets fit better at earlier times, and later when, when the signal has sped up, the fast wavelets are the ones who give the highest cross correlation. And in the end, um, what you do, you see here, is really a convolution of your signal here denoted by F with the respective wavelet. And then you, you square that to get a real number. And that real number is, as, as the Fourier power is called the wavelet power. And that's why the wavelet power spectra is in the end a two dimensional thing. So you have the time and you have the periods of frequency. So what you see is that, I mean, here you see it even by eye, right? So you have a low period in the beginning, the signal speeds up. So we see that in the wavelet spectrum, uh, nicely uh, time resolved that uh, we have first low periods and then high periods. Uh, sorry, the other way around. Um, no, uh, yes, at first high periods and then low periods. And um, if you do a Fourier transformation of the very same signal, what you get is just the one big blob, which basically mixes all these uh, all this information you get from the wavelet. I think I have something about asymptotic, yeah. So if you time average a wavelet power spectrum, so basically you just sum over the time axis, what you get, what you recover is the Fourier spectrum, which is also very nice. So like the many things you, you know or learn from Fourier theory, you can you can directly use by um, time averaging wavelet spectra. Um, yes, I think that is about, it's about, yeah, then I would already go to the rich. It was quite fast if there are questions. So we are, we are very few people. So it's really fine if someone has a question right now, please, please go ahead. Otherwise I would go a bit forward. All right. Um, so now the question is, so in, remember, we wanted to get uh, our amplitude, our period, and our phase. How do we actually do that? Because the wavelet spectrum itself is this two-dimensional array, right? That's uh, like at every time point, I basically have all this information here on the period axis. And the way um, people usually do that is by tracing a so-called wavelet ridge. So um, we use the most simplest approach, and so far that has always worked, it's just to sit on the respective maxima of the power. So that means um, that for every time point, you just look, okay, which period, so in that sense, which wavelet gives me the highest cross correlation at this moment in time. And this is where I, where I say, okay, this is, describes that signal at this time uh, the best. And if you want, you can also threshold this ridge. And then um, with that, you can extract um, components from your signal. Um, this is then what I call a rich evaluation. So once you have this rich, you can basically go back to the complex result of your transform. And then from the complex result, by basically pulling out the phase, for example, um, you, get, you get the phase or by pulling out the amplitude of these complex numbers over time, you get the amplitude and so on. So that means that from a, from a single signal, you first get the two dimensional spectrum. You do the rich estimation, maybe you threshold it, maybe you don't, you can also smooth it. And then you get as a readout, you get the period over time, you get the phase over time, you get the amplitude over time, and you get the power over time. And one thing which you maybe see, so the dashed lines here, by the way, is the real truth. So the ground truth for that signal and the solid line. And you see here is a huge discrepancy in the, in the amplitude, especially in the beginning. And this is really the, the one major drawback because it's a convolution-based method, sorry, convolution-based method you have the so-called edge effect. So you can imagine if I, if I slide the wavelet from left to right over the signal, at some point, the signal is, is over. So that means part of the wavelet are actually somewhere in the, in the nothing. And then only parts of the wavelet can be correlated with the signal. And that's why you lose typically at the beginning and at the end, you lose a lot of power. And there are some ways of getting around that, but then also, only works for only for special signals. So, so far we left that out. But as you can see, and this is actually rather important, that the period, for example, is almost not affected at all by these edge effects. So um, in that sense, it's, it's okay. You just have to know that if you want to look at amplitudes or wavelet power, then the edge effects are actually quite important. Okay, so noise robustness. Um, the cool thing is that because wavelets are convolution based. So if someone knows a bit about smoothing operations or something that are typically also convolutionary filters, 
you don't need to do anything. So, so wavelets, how do I write it here? Wavelet analysis has a built-in noise robustness, exactly. So here again, you see the ground truth and, and what, uh, uh, what comes out of the analysis. And uh, now to the trending, this is also a killer slide. So basically, um, we use, a, we use a, uh, a filter in the, in the frequency domain. So many people, you know, maybe you, heard, you, you know something like savitsky golai filter or moving average, something like that. These are filters who work great in the time domain, but if you use them on periodic signals, you get, you get funny surprises. So for example, here in this figure B, you see multiple different moving average filters and their frequency response if you use them for the trending. So for example, what you see is that uh, if you would use the filter with the dark red, so which has a width of 71 um, sampling intervals, you even get regions in the spectrum which get amplified. That was for me, was, come, so that was somehow surprising. And then you have the so-called roll off. So that means that it's pretty tough to, to cleanly separate um, certain components, uh, periodic components from your signal. So for example, let's say in this example, the trend lives here at probably 210 sampling intervals. And um, so with the, with the moving average, you have to really, so and the signal lives here on this, on this gray area. So moving average, you can tune it really, really uh, nicely. And then maybe you have it okay-ish. But as soon as maybe the trend jumps a bit around, you will never get a clean result. And with this, with this sync filter, um, its frequency response theoretically is really just a box. So that's the perfect filter. You really just cut out of, of the spectrum what you, what you want to see. Yeah, so this, uh, this curves level roll off, this is like the real sync filter because of course in reality, it's not a box because signals are finite and so on. But so the main point is that for example, Basically, all sync filters which have a period between, let's say, 90 and probably 170 will work very nicely in the setting. So you don't have to fine tune this so much. And even if, if you're, let's say, you measure one signal, which are, then the sync filter will still do the job nicely for you. Whereas other filters, maybe you already jump into a different region where it performs very differently. And so if you use another sync filter on our, um, on our noisy signal with a very strong trend, you see that basically it looks exactly like before. So the detrending is, is, is I would call uh, perfect, yeah. Um, so you really get, get very clean rid of the trends. Um, and then the last point, smoothing noise. So this is just an example. So for example, um, here you see an, an unfiltered noisy um, signal which already, of course, it has a bit of like wavelet power. You see, of course, that the, the scale is the same. So here from one to 40. But if I use the smoothing, so I think this is probably the smoothing average smooth, suddenly oscillations appear. And, and this is really bad. So this means you, you, you introduce a very strong bias in your, in your analysis. And actually, depending on how you filter your data, I can pretty much probably even calculate with what probability you will see oscillations in a certain noise signal. So this is what we did in the, in the paper then. Um, yeah, so that, that's why smoothing is not needed. So maybe other analysis is like Hilbert transform, their smoothing is very much needed and that can lead really to, to problems. Yeah. And how does it look? So here's just another example of this. Let's say you have a huge noise trajectory and of course it's noise, then you smooth it and suddenly you see there are these, these, these blobs popping up and I just zoomed into one of here, which is basically just a repeat. And you see, wow, suddenly actually you have somewhat like maybe one, two, three, four, five oscillations even though that it's really just noise uh, and even white noise here. And just uh, as a comment, uh, you can theoretically calculate what, what is the so-called gain. So how much more power will you see, which is actually not there, which just comes from the filter. And here you see that for the moving average, which I think uh, window size of five. Yeah. Okay, so this is already the wrapping up. So the, the, the setting was we have a noisy signal with trend we want to get our, our periods, amplitudes, and phases. And I hope I convinced you that at least for this example, it works nicely. And if you just have noise, then you really see, see nothing or like almost nothing, let's say. So it's very clear to distinguish that, right? And so now to, to pi ball itself. Um, so pi ball is on GitHub, of course. Um, it also has a, as I already mentioned, um, a little paper which describes in more detail our arguments why we do things the way we do it. And uh, for me, the most important thing was that it's actually click installable, how, how I call it, because I think many of potential users are maybe not so com comfortable on the command line. So if you go to the GitHub page, you see um, you see really instructions how to install it via Anaconda 
without using the command line. So in the end, um, you just have to do a few clicks, type in once the conda port, and then it will show up in the in the navigator because I made it in so-called Anaconda Navigator app. So that just I don't know if, if someone of you have seen that. So for example, Jupiter is of course also an app. The only thing is you cannot put your own icons there. So this is only reserved for I don't know. I guess there is some like not everyone is equal on Anaconda Navigator apparently. But other than that, people can just start it by clicking on launch, and you can update it by clicking here on this uh, plot here. And for people who uh, who like scripting, of course, uh, PyBot is also a Python package, which you can just import, and it offers a object-oriented um, uh, API. And then in the repository is also a scripting template, where you basically see in a few lines all the steps I just did, um, and it spits it out for you. And just a little um, like a teaser that um, so since last week I actually also put the, the follow-up, the so-called spatial PyBot. So this is now for if you have spatially extended systems, let's say tissue slices, where, where you have oscillations spatially distributed, then I have now also SpyBoat, which is on the so-called uh, Galaxy web service. I don't know if you know that it's a web UI. And yeah, so basically you can upload your movies and then you get, uh, again, then you get like the, the phase, the period, the power and amplitude movies out of that. Yeah, but with this, I would, if there are no further questions, I would finally go to the, to the live demo. But please, if uh, if there are questions, I'm really happy to to answer them. If not, then uh, let's do it. So if you if you start up by boat, it's just a super tiny window where you basically can uh, start the synthetic generator or open your data. And for the start, we will do the the generator. And the synthetic signal generator is so all what I told you um, trends noise, um, amplitude envelopes, and so on, you can basically test that here. And it works, or, or also what doesn't work. But for now, I will start with a very simple, um, very simple signal. So for example, uh, let's get the trend out. So here you have, you see, I basically recreated the signal, which is similar to what I showed in the, in the, uh, in the presentation. Yes. And for such a signal, you don't have to do anything, right? Because it's clean as hell. You can click on uh, analyze signal. Then, uh, of course. So first, so check what I did here. So the basics are how many sample points do I have? So how many um, how many recordings do you have in your time series? Then the sampling interval. So for example, is it one minute, ten days, forty five microseconds? What do I know? And uh, here you can also put the time unit. And then you have the oscillator one where you can start with an initial period and the final period. And here it goes from 50 minutes to 70 minutes. So if I want to really resolve all of these periods, of course, I have to scan at least, let's say, from 40 to 80 or something. So then for the analysis, the wavelet analysis, which is here in the lower right, I, I just have the parameters. What is the smallest period I want to scan for? How many do I want? This is just the resolution. And then what is the highest? And because I have 70 here, maybe I go to 80. And then if you click on analyze signal, you get um, your wavelet spectrum. Um, yes, it shows you here in this case that the, that the signal slows down. Then you can, you can, if you want, you can also rescale the power. So for example, 91 is apparently something like the maximum power here, but uh, and you can also change the power. Yeah, just to show you that uh, that is just the color map in the end. Yeah. And then you can detect the maximum ridge, which here is, of course, super clean. Maybe we can, in principle, we could, but here thresholding makes no sense because the signal is super clean. And if you then click on um, plot ridge readout, then you get these, um, these results that I showed you. And you see here this this dash lines. Um, these are regions which, which are affected by this edge effects that I showed you before. So this is the, basically I can make this triangle and then it shows, ah, okay, so the amplitudes, I actually, I can only trust them here, right, very in the middle. And um, yeah, this is what basically encoded here by dashed and, and solid line. Okay, so this was for a clean signal. And now, for example, you could start, let's say we put a second, um, if I start a second oscillator, where we're we 50 and 70, let's say I put it at 120. 
constantly. And now, so we know now that basically we have two periodic components. Um, the largest one is 120. So I check, I go to my highest period of 150. Um, and if I now analyze that, I see basically it looks a bit ugly because the, the, the slower oscillations, there are maybe uh, how many, one, sorry, two oscillations are only there. But so the point is that basically here we treat this, the new tensor as a, as a background that, that we are not interested in. And we see the actual signal, the signal we, we had before, is now pretty much hidden, right? So it's, uh, the power is low. And if you would not know it's there, you could even miss it. And this is why we have this sync filter detrain. So now um, I can basically choose a cutoff period and say, okay, everything which is larger than that, I remove from my signal. And because I, I, I um, here I know that my periods are between 50 and 70, and the ones I want to get rid of are 120. So maybe I put something like 100. Um, I, I uh, plot the, the trend. So basically, the after you, um, yes, the trend. So the trend that you that you subtract from your signal to get your detrended signal. You can also right away um, actually plot the the detrended signal. You see that. So um, let's check it. So for example, let's say I don't remove remove that. So I get two, something like 200, and we see it's still rather ill. And if I'm really strict, and I go down to 80, then I should almost remove it entirely. I mean, it doesn't work super, super good because the signal is, is uh, um, short, but I hope you get the idea. So now if I, if I do the same analysis, um, you see that the upper part is basically completely gone and the signal I'm actually interested is there. And this is why the trending is, um, is important, yeah. Uh, and just, so of course, this is probably not, um, not the most realistic Thing. So usually you take a really long, long, I don't know what do we have, let's put it really to 1000, maybe with a rather high amplitude, you see, then you get already something like that. Um, maybe let's try to get at least some up and down. Um, yes. Yeah, something like that. So you see that with basically with the second oscillator, you can in principle simulate a lot of different trends. And now if, if I do the same, so I still use the same, oh sorry, I do the cutoff again on 80. And I just show the detrended signal, and you see now it works really nicely, right? So this is now after the trend is removed. It basically looks like so now it will be quick, but so I remove the second oscillator, I plot the raw signal again. And I hope you have seen somehow that it looked almost the same. So this is just perfectly trending. Um, okay, and then now let's go to noise. Um, so noise, there, there are of course many different types of noise. And, and here we just simulate a so-called autoregressive process, which is some of the simplest noises which have some correlations in them. Yeah? So many people think so that noise is always somehow white noise or very fuzzy. So maybe let's just look at noise, uh, just only noise. So for example, now I simulated 250 samples of white noise. And every time I click here, of course, I get a different uh, sample. But just to show you how really highly correlated noise can already have quite some structure. I mean, I hope you see the difference. So this even looks, uh, it looks almost like, a, like an oscillation, right? And um, maybe let's do it for a really long, long, uh, let's say we go 2,000. Um, yes. And now I do the wavelet analysis. So you see there's things happening all over the place. Uh, and um, with this is basically so in, in the optimal world, you have you have a, you have a way to estimate your background noise. If you don't, if you cannot do it, it's it's pretty tough. But at least you can see that um, that you can also really measure just pure noise and you still get, for example, here, there's a short part which has a apparent period of like 200 minutes, um, something like that, yeah. But the important, uh, the, 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 the interesting part, of course, is if you mix it with your signal. So I guess here, for example, it's basically hidden. Maybe I go down a bit with the correlations. 
shorter again. Yeah, so now you see the signal is actually, we can actually, yeah, it's, you still see it. So noise strength is really just, uh, if you want the amplitude of the noise, so I increase it a bit. Yes, and now I do the analysis. And you see, in principle, it's still there, but it's clear. So maybe let's compare it directly. So for that, I deactivate the noise just for now, make the clean signal, uh, make the wavelet analysis. We get something like this. And now I put the power on 100 so that we have, that we can compare it. Now I turn the noise on uh, to the analysis and go to the same the same maximum power and you see the difference is, is striking right so of course the noise in the sense um degrades degrades your signal and you have less wavelet power so there's no way around it but it's still i would say rather high so you see it's here like 20 25 26 so for example the mean um, mean expected uh, power for white noise is one so um yeah and then maybe one more thing uh, the last thing, of, and then we can jump into real data, is the so-called um, amplitude envelope. So the synthetic signal generator just has an exponential envelope. And when I put the decay time to 250, you see that basically it's just a degradation of the, of the amplitude. And this can have a very strong effect on your, on your wavelet power, unfortunately, you see. So actually, it's a super clean signal. There's no noise. It's a perfect oscillation, but the power drops a lot. And this is, of course, um, yeah, this is maybe not what you want. And for that, um, there's also a way to estimate a so-called amplitude envelope. Um, and this is really just a sliding window, which, which gets you the, the like mean and maximum values and therefore um, estimates an, 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 an amplitude. Let me just check what I put here now. So we have 70, maybe 100 is enough. You can also plot this envelope. Of course, for exponential envelope, it works like a charm. I guess there are situations where it actually doesn't work so nice. But now I can also normalize my signal with the envelope. And if I now do the analysis, um, sorry, you see the difference, right? So basically, I pump up this, this low amplitude oscillations and I have a really nice uh, um, power. And that is important that, for example, if your signal decays into a noise floor or something, that can really make the difference between um, actually, I'm not sure if there's anything, but after you remove this envelope, you will see that there is, that there is something. Yeah, or, or not, but you should make the difference. Um, yes, I think at least for the synthetic data, that is it. Again, um, are there questions um, regarding here the, the synthetic signal generator? I take that as a no. Okay, then let's jump into some real data. So in the end, uh, PyBoard accepts tabular data in the form that every column is a signal. And it's pretty generous. So in the end, I use some pandas routines in the back, which nowadays can read in almost everything. So CSV, text, or even Excel. But um, yeah, I mean, if you have very weird input, um, it maybe it doesn't work. But like for, for standard, for standard uh, tables, it should work. And if you open a real data sheet, so now I opened here an, an Excel sheet of real data. So this is now. Also, again, if you remember the, the initial biological example about the somatogenesis or the process of um, body axis segmentation in vertebrates, this is now here from, from FISH, um, graciously provided by um, Rachner from um, EPFL in, in Lausanne. Um, and so first, what you see is you see just a table. And if you, if you can directly click on these different traces here, and then so this is what we call the data viewer. So this is basically just to yeah, to get an overview of what you have, you can slide your left and right. I think these are probably around 30, 40 tracks. So these are single cell tracks here. And um, then the most important part, if you want to have real units, is to put a sampling interval. So I know that this data was recorded with 3.5 minutes uh, for each frame. So now you see um, also the, the time changes accordingly. So if I go back to one, then suddenly the traces are only like what 60, but we know it's actually 3.5. So you automatically get your proper length of the time series. Um, and now it's basically the same game. So I, you see that it, this part of the, of the UI is exactly like the synthetic signal generator, but instead of 
having a synthetic signal, you pick a signal from your from your table. And as you see, these signals can be quite wild. So maybe looks that looks like a very nice one. Yeah, but so in the end, so maybe like that, how do you do it? Like uh, let's say we don't know what is there, right? So we could just check, okay, we have 200 minutes recording and more than a period of 200, right? So this is like a good default. And um, if you just do the analysis and we see something, we see, ah, okay. So if you remember from the, from the detrending synthetic example, so this is probably again, just kind of low frequency, big trends. You see already here, there is like a, the signal is a bit curved, but here this lower block, that looks like, aha, uh -huh, that could be something. And this is in the range, uh, let's say, up to 70 or up to 80 minutes. So then um, I take again my sync cutoff, maybe put it at 70. I can plot the trend and you see what it's doing. It's doing a bit more than I expected. Um, I can again look at the detrended signal. So this is basically what now the what PyBot now sees. Do I still have the other spectrum? So I just do that again. So this is how it was without detrending. So now I detrend it. And oh yeah, that worked great. So you see, um, you see that all this funny block is completely removed, and you have nicely here your your signal and your, your spectrum. I can also this is basically the people who know matplotlib. So this is basically a matplotlib figure with embedded into this um, GUI. So you can also zoom into that. Um, I don't know what else you can, you can, I can, you can directly save it out if you want this, this particular figure. I think you can, yeah, that's probably the most you can do. And so now to, to finish up, so we do a, um, a rich estimation again. So this time you see the rich spans the whole time. And maybe now we think that this year, ooh, I don't know, I don't trust that so much. What is the power? The power is 1.5, this is basically nothing. So we can use a threshold maybe five or something like that. Um, yes, and now you see the rich is actually only from, from here to there, which is, if you look at it, um, so the time definitely matches then you would also see by eye, okay, maybe from this point on, I can trust that this is really an, an oscillation. And then you can plot your readout. And again, biology, the traces are often short, but uh, yes, so I, again, amplitude probably you can only trust in, in this region here but uh, the period you can definitely see. And what you see there is actually a slowdown of the signal, right? So it starts maybe with 50 minutes and then it slows down to 56 or something. So there's a, there's a moderate slowdown. Um, okay, so now what, what, what do you do, of course? Um, so once you have the settings, so I took a cutoff period of 70. Okay, maybe actually I, now that I remove everything which is slower than 70 minutes, it makes sense to just check maybe to 100 minutes so I have the interesting part of the spectrum a bit more, more focused. And now you can just click through your signals and it, as you see it already, will, it will right away show you the detrended the signal feed it for a different signal, for example, that one here. And then you see, aha, uh -huh, this, this is not so nice. It's very noisy here in the beginning. The signal is maybe only two and a half oscillations clear and so on. But of course, that gets that gets a bit tiring, right? So, 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 and do you want to do that for every signal, and then you save the results? So, for that, there is this uh, like a batch processing, which I call analyze all. And um, if you click on that, then another little window opens, where basically you can um, you can first of all you can put the rich threshold. Other than that, it will take all the parameters you have here. So it will take your sync filter. If you want to do an amplitude envelope removal, it will also take that first period. Um, and what it, what it can do is, for example, it can give you what I call ensemble dynamics. So maybe let's go back. Do we have a readout window? Um, not really, so I just do a little analysis here. Whoa, that is also wild. So here is maybe a good example. Huh? So you see that, of course, uh, this is probably not very realistic, but uh, well, this is, that is how it is. Yeah, it's a very noisy signal, and suddenly the rich jumps up. So, anyways, um, you get if you do the readout, um, you, here you see the jump in period. You get period, phase, amplitude, and power over time, right? And now, if I go, if I do that for all of them, um, you get the so-called ensemble dynamics. So maybe let's just do it. So, 
whoops, oh, damn it. So here you see it's very similar to the to the result I just showed you, but this is now for all of the signals. So here you see that, uh, that this is the period distribution over time of this particular ensemble. And you see, okay, in the beginning, there's a lot of un un uncertainty and we already actually saw also in the individual trajectories that they are very noisy in the beginning, but still on average, you, you get an estimate for the period. And then you see also a very clear trend. So I mean, we know biologically that this oscillation slow down. So this is pretty much what you should see. And then the same goes, for example, for the amplitude and also for the power. And then there's one more readout, which in this particular uh, example doesn't make that much sense because the individual cells are not synchronized, but you also get a phase coherence measure. So let's say you have, you have, a, you have a bunch of coupled oscillators, which you maybe expect that they're in synchronized or not. This is then this phase coherence will tell you that. So if you have a very high phase coherence, that means most of the oscillators are in the same phase. If there's a low phase coherence, then um, basically they are dispersed and, and everyone is doing what, what, what he wants or what she wants. Uh, okay, so just one lastly to this, what else can you do with this batch processing? You can basically export a bunch of stuff. So the individual spectra, um, you, the, the readouts, the readout plots, you can even sort by average power. So for example, that can be helpful if you want to know, um, maybe I have some oscillatory traces, some non-oscillatory traces. If you sort by, the, by this power, basically you should see that on top are your best oscillators and on the bottom are your worst oscillators. Then these ensemble dynamics that I just showed you and the period distribution. And this may be interesting. Um, so this is like the average, the average spectrum. So now this is really like a full year spectrum but it comes from the ensemble and time averaged wavelet spectra. So this, that's why also you see there's a quartile. So there's some statistics. And of course, now we, we lose uh, in that sense, we don't have any time resolution anymore, but we see that, aha, uh -huh, this ensemble, apparently there's quite something going on between, uh, yeah, let's say 40 and 60 minutes, right? So this can, this can be actually nice. Also, if you have different sets of, of, of data sets and, and you, you, you can directly compare that, maybe there's like a huge shift in the population, there's some, some stimulus or, what do I know? And finally, rich power distribution, that's maybe the least interesting for non-experts. This just gives you um, of all the ridges that you found, what is, what is the average power of them? And uh, so this basically tells you how strong are my oscillations. And these here are not that strong. So 12 is really, is really not that much. Um, yeah, I think. I think that's actually it. I think I walked you through almost everything. I mean, there's also a Fourier transform here, which is very easy, but yeah, I mean, for the short signals, there will probably not, not much come out anyways. Let me see, yeah. I mean, that makes more sense for, for longer signals or just to compare it, maybe with the synthetic signal generator, that is good, yeah. Um, yeah, but I think that that should be the complete tour. So Thank now, you, um, Greg. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if you have questions in the audience. So either raise your hand in the participant uh, window box or just speak up if you don't mind to be on camera here or type your question in the chat. I have a quick question if that's okay. Um, really, really interesting look, looking bit of software, uh, Gregor, it looks really nice. I was just, I missed the beginning five minutes, so sorry about that, but um, I was curious as to how you built it and how you created a GUI which looks so nice and does um, it work on Windows? Particularly, I like, love that you've put it into Anaconda Navigator. Mm -hmm. I mostly use that for Windows, does it, would it work? Yes, yes. so it's, uh, where is it? It's a PyQt GUI and PyQt is cross-platform, so it, um, it works on, on all platforms. Windows, Mac, and, and Linux. And also Anaconda is really nice because it's pure Python, so you can go no arch and there's really no problem. So it's, it's, it's very nicely deployable, I think. You know PyQt? So this is like, a, a Qt is, a, is originally a C++ library for, for, for GUI programming. And then there are Python bindings, which is, it is quite an object-oriented library, but once you know a bit, uh, your way around it's actually super comfortable and it also works nicely you see this uh, the resizing and, and and it also works on different screen sizes and qt is fantastic they, they do so many things for you in the background i can highly recommend yeah cool thanks 
I'll have a look at that. Do we have more questions? I would ask a question if nobody else has one. Go ahead, Marion. <laughs> um, I was just wondering because, um, I mean, you went around clicking lots of buttons and I'm not an expert in these things and so, but I was just wondering, do you have to know what you are doing or is there any kind of guidance or so in terms of, um, okay, what do I actually have to do if I want to get these things out? So I've seen you've got some documentation on your GitHub um, but um, so how yeah. else do you actually guide your users? Um, I mean, there's the paper, of course, right? Um, and other than the GitHub, uh, we have a few very short promotional videos, but somehow we never got really going with that. Maybe that's a good point. Um, but in the end, so the important part is that if you just want to do um, a simple analysis, you just need basically three numbers. The one number is what is the cutoff period of my filter? So basically, do I, what is the maximum period I expect in my signal? And everything else I, I throw out to, to remove this low frequency trend. So this is the first number, which is probably the hardest. And then the other numbers are just, uh, OK, now I want to do my wavelet spectrum. So what is the lowest period I want to scan for? And what is the highest period? And, and this number of periods just tells you the resolution. Yeah? So just maybe to show you here for the last thing. Um, so here is this particularly nice spectrum. If I now just go to, let's say, 10 of those, then you should, then you see the, right? So you see the, the resolution breaks down and now just 10 different wavelets do it. So this is not even a, a real parameter. This basically just gives you resolution. So in that sense, we advertise it also easy to use. In the end, the, the cutoff period is hard. So I mean, if, if you cut off your, the only thing you can do wrong is, is basically remove parts of the signal that you are interested in. Or you, you, you look at, for example, um, maybe let's jump to a little bit of nicer signal here. Uh, that one looks very good. And bump that up. So let's say we have this very nice signal, but for some reasons uh, you don't know what you're doing. So actually you scan for periods, let's say from 50 to, to 200. Um, if you do that, then of course there is basically nothing, right? So this could happen. So that suddenly you, you, you look at the region of the spectrum where there is just nothing. But um, yes, but more, more really more, there's no much, not, there is not more to say about it. You need the three numbers. Thank you. What, what, what would you, your idea, how could I guide it better? So like really do, doing a, the, like a better documentation or like more step-by-step -step or something or? Now I was wondering whether there are some default values or um, ranges of values or something like um, mouse tips or um, anything. I mean, so because um, from just as a non-expert looking at these things, I would just say, okay, what kind of numbers do I actually put in there? And what do I expect then as an outcome? Yes, so I mean, I try to, I just open the same file again. But videos are a good so point. Are they linked at your the... GitHub? The what? The videos that you mentioned. No, no. Um, I think, yeah, I, it was not me doing it. And, and at some point, I just wanted to show you. So if you just uh, randomly, uh, just, if you just open the data firsthand and you click on a signal, you see that already numbers are in. And I mean, they are not the best numbers in the world. But uh, in principle, you see it's a bit too, too low here. But this is just because these are very short trajectories. But for example, the cutoff period is already set I would say in a sensible default, yeah. Okay, let's continue with Alessandro. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first is, um, is there a command line interface or something like that as well? Or can I, can I use this from within a Python script or is this designed to be used as a GUI specifically? No, no, of course, there's a Python package, which is called PyVault, okay. you can even pip install it. Uh, and then and, and in, the, in the repository, there's a scripting template um, where you see that, uh, of course, scripting is so much faster. And I personally use it, of course, uh, in the scripting way, I have to say. Um, yes, so to answer your question, yeah, it's a proper Python sure, package. Yeah. And I, you can, you can, you I, can missed, I missed that. And to do Thanks. a basic weighted analysis, that should be like five lines. 
Super. Um, my, so, so I'm not very much uh, an expert in this wavelet analysis, but I'm quite interested. Um, the question I had is, if I know there's going to be two oscillations interfering with each other in my signal, can I use that this wavelet analysis to mm -hmm. find these two overlapping um, oscillations? Um, yes. So maybe as I, just for fun, I tried. So what do you mean by two overlapping? So like something really very close or so let's say mm -hmm. I put one at 50 minutes and the other one at maybe. Yeah, I mean, the, the example I have in mind is maybe like five times one one um, period is five times the other period ballpark. Wow, okay, that's a lot, but yeah, you can do that. But then, of course, you already need quite a like long recordings, right? <laughs> so perfect. Maybe let's 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 use some <laughs> odd number that looks a bit more uh, a bit more funny. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. So. Um, so in this sense, so if you really only have these two components, I mean, then the cutoff period should be, of course, much larger than, than the slow oscillation that you also have in your signal. And if you now do the, the wavelet spectrum, then you should see both of them. And the, the thing is that, of course, the, for a bit of technical reasons, the, the low periods have much higher power. So if you think about it, um, basically, it's the same sampling interval, so the density of sampling is the same, but then lower periods have much more sample points per oscillation. And statistically, it makes sense, right? So if you, for example, let's say you only have three sample points per oscillation, that they randomly look a bit like, uh, is, is very likely, uh, so because power is basically right. an indicator of the statistical power of the oscillation. But um, if I, so this is now, you see the power gets, gets astronomically high also, we are 350. So if I just go down to 50 and, um, and I zoom in here, then basically it's it's purely resolved, but you get it, right? Now, yeah. the rich is of course the thing. So, um, I mean, that goes back to my initial problem definition. So, uh, so it's it's basically, you, you, you want to extract one one oscillatory component and, and there's no way, so there's only one rich. So that is the point of the rich, right? So it should not, uh, it, it it should not alternate or something like that or you cannot you can also not have for this for, for one time point two rich points so in that sense um if you have something like that i would do two analysis right so now right, yeah. i would remove first uh, i would remove the, the this component maybe this 200 uh, we see here the trend does it very nicely so it's gone and if you now do the rich it sits at your first component right and yeah. uh, because the, the the slower ones always have the higher power, if you don't remove it, you get the second one. Right? Gotcha. Does it Thanks very question? much. Yeah, it does. Thank you.